Uh, you know, and I want to double click on AI, but before we get there, uh, you spoke about a chip kind of getting on your ski skin rather than you trying to wear so many devices. So have you heard about Neil Harbinson, who's been running uh, this human cyborg program for many times, and he's put a chip in his behind his brain, and it's a probe which is coming out. Uh, uh, have you heard about him? Uh, I have seen him uh, speak at one of the conferences, but uh, he is a human cyborg and he's running a human cyborg program and it's not just him uh, there are many others and the reason why he has a chip and the probe coming out of his my, uh, brain is uh, because uh, he is color blind he can't see color but he today with that probe he can feel the color if it is green he can feel the color in a different way or blue or red in a very different way and uh, he's fascinating in terms of what's happening and there are many others who are now experimenting with that uh, which is scary as well, uh, to be very transparent, uh, but these chips, you know, any external piece, like if somebody gets a fracture, they put some, uh, you know, plates in there, those plates degrade and they have a negative effect on human body. These external devices, if they are integrated with our body, can have a negative effect. Do you think if that my perspective is right or wrong? I mean, I think there's risk to anything. You take a, you take a pill to lower your, you know, blood cholesterol, and it has side effects. You know, I take ibuprofen when I get headaches, and I know it has potential for side effects too. Um, you know, I think I I heard um, a perspective on this, which I thought was very interesting. Mm. Um, we're all everybody's kind of, or I would say, a knee jerk reaction is to feel kind of creeped out at the idea of some invasive implant. At the same time, the vast majority of people, the first thing that they do in the morning is check their phone. And the last thing that they do when they go to bed is check their phone. Mm. And most people are within an arm's reach of that device at all times. And so if that's not a, uh, a technological prosthetic, then, then I'm not sure what is. The only difference is that you, you know, it's still not attached, not yet. So I think in terms of behavior um especially for now that we've got you know we have the apple watch of course and um i i don't think it's as much of a of a leap forward as it may seem um and although i'm not familiar with um with the example you cite you know i'm a big fan of the science fiction writer john scalzi and i like his version of the uh, the brain pal mm -hmm. uh, if i'm gonna go with any kind of prosthetic on that oh, very interesting so let's switch gears about AI. Like you said, there is, you know, the uh, competition or the company who's in a similar space trying to use AI to recommend uh, the dietary or the other aspects of a human health uh, to its customers. Now there's so much of hype about LLMs, right? There's so much of hype about ChatGPT today. Uh, I know a lot of people are trying to find diets on ChatGPT, right? Making it a diet question right uh, or diet interface uh, even i did that that day you know i wanted to just uh, dabble in and find out okay which foods are most high in high uh, fiber right so uh, it gave me some certain responses and that was interesting to see that it has that medical information and today uh, you know is that in your perspective is that good or bad like having this kind of information open out to common people well the information's always been there i think uh just llms make it accessible in a in an easier way you know i think the skill of knowing what to google is going mm -hmm. away like that's not going to matter very soon and i think that's fine i don't necessarily see a problem with the vision of the internet where you know the raw data is here and it sits under this layer that is queryable by us humans in a very human way. Mm -hmm. um, so on the other hand, I think there's a ton of hype about the technology and, you know, we've done some applications for large language models on our team to um, better I, extract knowledge from kind of freeform conversations. Um, and you know, I think I think they're very useful for that application. Would mm -hmm. I trust any kind of medical treatment or diagnosis um, or even recipe, honestly, yeah. that 
a um, that a chatbot would recommend me. Not necessarily, not yet. You know, they're right a lot of the time, or they're approximately right a lot of the time. But there's enough error that I don't think we can just declare all of these problems solved because um, before you can trust the technology to replace the human brain, you know, you you first have to vet it very, very carefully. And because the responses of of these models are not deterministic, every every response is new. Mm -hmm. uh, it becomes very difficult to know upfront that it's going to give you factually accurate information. So I think there's just a lot, a lot, a lot of QA and vetting that we would want to do before we make take any actions or make any decisions of any consequence on the basis of the information we get. And with not just LLM, but with the advent of AI now, with a lot of applications of science coming in and the availability of data, which has been the other factor, a lot of experiments has sped up, right? Something which took 10 years doesn't take that much time anymore. So when you were doing your PhD, I'm sure you would have had a lot of struggle with data and the application of science. And when you look at today's generation, because you are also collaborating with universities, you are collaborating with a lot of nonprofits. Do you see that a big difference in the last decade, specifically with the advent of AI and technology become available to everyone? I think what I have seen change for the better is not so much that there's brand new technologies that are radically disrupting how we do science. It's just that more and more people are recognizing the need to be literate in basic data science. So, you know, I'm a little ashamed to admit that when I did my PhD, I did all my data analysis in a spreadsheet. I didn't know uh, how to use programming language in order to, to run all these. I, I knew how to use I knew how to program, but I did not have, I wasn't taught to programmatically interrogate my data and run, you know, statistical analyses um, mm. in a more reproducible way. Uh, so that's something that's changing and that has changed. And I think that's only for the better. I hope you enjoyed this clip from my podcast series called Masters Decoded. The intention of bringing these clips to you is to allow you to understand some key moments of the conversations I've had with my guest. I would recommend and highly encourage you to listen to the entire podcast, which you can find the link to the podcast in the description below. I look forward to you subscribing to my channel and hit the bell icon so that you can be notified of all the future clips which we keep releasing every week on this channel.